And I want to welcome you to our new series here that we're in right now, Old School. Matter of fact, I brought my old school big Bible. You know, I preach out of a little thin Bible now, but in the old school, baby, we had the big Bibles. Last, uh, last week, Pastor Todd shared with us what it means to experience the salvation of God through His grace and His mercy, and then to allow His Spirit to sanctify us. Those are good old terms, isn't it? Being saved and sanctified. The sanctifies us, set us apart for the work that God has ordained and the purpose He has called into our lives. And today, we're gonna to continue in the old school as we explore the significance of the blood of Jesus that He shed on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. So we're so glad you're here. Hey, grab a seat here in Gardens and all of our other campuses and online, we love you. Oh, look at this, look at this. This pulpit, I get, get a, uh, back up and get a bigger shot of this pulpit. I want them to see the pulpit here a little bit. All right, this pulpit was built by my grandfather and uh, it was 60 plus years ago I preached my first sermon behind this pulpit. I was just, I was just 16 and a half years old, and I, I preached my first sermon behind this pulpit. And um, I, I used to lead worship behind this. Now, when, we, when I led worship back in the day, you'd stand behind the pulpit like this, get a good grip, and then we'd sing, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. You know, so we would, we would just wave our arms around. I never knew what that meant, but I saw other people doing it, so I just waved my arms, you know. I guess you're supposed to be beating out the time for the people as we did that. But um, I want to show you a picture of my grandfather. You got, do we have that picture of Grandpa? Look at Grandpa, uh, isn't that something? Uh, there, he's preaching the Word of God behind his pulpit. Let's see, can I get the pose right? I need some black rim glasses. Grandpa was about six foot four, so I, I never could reach up to his uh, level. But I want to tell you something about the first time I preached my first message. I'm sitting back in, in the old school days, we had thrown chairs on the platform. I, I don't know where they came from, but they were thrown chairs. They were big, tall chairs. And I'm sitting back there beside my grandfather, and I'm as nervous as can be. Matter of fact, I'm so nervous, I feel nauseated. And I, I reached over and grabbed Grandpa by the arm, and I said, Grandpa, I, I'm, I'm feeling nauseated. I, I, I can't do this. And he looked at me with a big old smile on his face, and then he, he put his hand over on me, and he said, Son, don't ever lose that feeling. It's a sacred trust to share the Word of God. And you know what? I've never lost that feeling because I realize that every time we step up to bring the Word of God, it's a sacred trust of God to share the Word of God. I've uh, had the privilege to share the Word of God around the world uh, on every continent, and I never go to share the Word on any continent or behind any pulpit that I do not think of those words of my grandfather. Many times, matter of fact, one time I was stepping out onto the platform in Zimbabwe, Africa, in the capital city of Arari, and I was stepping out in that city and the preach celebration church, and they were introducing me by a video introduction. There were about 4,000 people in the auditorium and I'm side stage ready to come out, and as, I'm, as it hits me that I'm here because of the faithfulness of my grandfather and uh, his life and his, his legacy and, and his uh, instruction into my life and pouring into my life, I wouldn't be there one for him. And then I got real sentimental, and I started crying. I, just, I couldn't hold back the tears. Then my nose started to run. Now they say it's time for me to come out, so I come out, to proclaim for 4,000 people the Word of God. My nose is running, I have nothing to wipe it with. I'm teary-eyed, I'm boo-hooing, and they're trying to figure out what is going on with this guy. And finally, someone had mercy on me from the front row and brought me some, some uh, a handkerchief and I was able to get my nose cleared out and wipe my eyes clean and then I told them the story of my grandfather's life and legacy and the impact it had on me. By the way, I want you to know about this. Uh, I, I went up to preach in Southern Ohio about uh, 15 years ago, 
And they had me speak at this conference and, and uh, they brought this pulpit from my grandfather's church that he had built in Hamilton, Ohio. And they brought it for me to speak behind. And then I did not know this, but when I was done with the conference, they gave it to me as a gift. So this is a treasure gift of mine. I keep it in my office. And you know, on, on football teams, they have a certain traditions where like, you know, Notre Dame, when they run out of the locker room, they've got a sign up there about champions, they hit it. Everybody's got their thing that, you know, they hit. You know, this is, this is what I touch every time I come out. This sacred desk of God. Okay, now enough for the introduction. So what is all the significance? We're singing all these songs, we're selling all this celebration, and we're talking about the blood of Jesus. Why are we doing this? Well, to understand this, let's go back first to Jesus when he was sharing the final meal with his disciples, known as the Passover meal, and we know it as the Last Supper that he had with his disciples. And he was there sharing with them, and at the time of the toast of the cup of the covenant, he lifted up the cup among them and he said this in verse 28 of chapter 26. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Now what made it different was, it wasn't this is the cup of covenant, he said this is my blood of the covenant. Now the disciples understood what covenant meant. They understood the significance of blood associated with covenant because they were celebrating what had taken place centuries before in Egypt when the children of Israel, after 400 years of bondage in Egypt, God sent Moses to deliver them out. After all the plagues that were brought upon Egypt because of Pharaoh's stubborn heart and not willing to release the children of Israel, there was one final plague that God was going to send. It was a death angel that would take the firstborn of everyone in Egypt. And so Moses rallied the children of Israel and said, listen, take a lamb, sacrifice that lamb, take its blood and put it on the doorpost of your home, over the, the head of the, of, of the lentils and, and down the side post of the home. And when the death angel comes, he will see the blood. Well, here, let me read it to you. In Exodus 12, 13, it says this. The blood will be a sign for you. And when I see the blood, the Spirit of God says, I will pass over you. And so the blood was a sign of the covenant. The word covenant means to cut. God entered into covenant with Abraham, Father Abraham, that Abraham would be the one who would carry the message of there is one true living God of the universe. Because in a pagan world, men had created their own gods to worship. And, and God needed someone to carry the message through the centuries of the one true living God. And that's why we, we refer oftentimes to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they carried it through their generations, the message that they had entered into in covenant with God to proclaim his truth and glory to the world. And through that covenant now, Moses comes to set the children of Israel free. And that's why blood was used in that covenant as it was when God first went into covenant with Abraham. It's a fascinating thing when you study it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us, this blood stuff. Blood, why is blood associated with covenant? Because Hollywood has perverted it and the pagan world has perverted it of what God meant as a sign pointing forward to his ultimate salvation that would come to mankind one day on the cross of Calvary with Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. That's where we have to understand and comprehend what God was trying to do. So as we go back to that night of the Passover, and I'm trying my very best because this is an old school series to stay behind the pulpit. <laughs> we always preach from behind the pulpit, you know, and every once in a while, if you wanna make a point, you'd pound that pulpit. I'm used to walking around and engaging, so I guess I can go all the way this far as long as I hold on to the pulpit. 
not get too far away. I don't want to get too far away. <laughs> but let's go back to that night. God's timing has always been perfect for mankind. Everything that God was doing in the Old Testament with the children of Israel as God was instructing Moses in the wilderness and sacrifice became an integral part of their expression of worship and devotion to God because, and blood became a significant part of that whole ritual because blood represented life, it was the life force. And when there was a sacrifice involved, that represented complete devotion. So it, it was symbolic of a completely devoted life that was surrendered to God and they came the best they could know how they would make those sacrifices of that which was unique to them. Now by the way, a man's wealth was measured by his herds, his flocks. And when he brought the best of the best of what represented his wealth before the Lord in a form of a sacrifice, that was a demonstration of love and devotion to God. So Jesus is in Jerusalem. He comes in, you know, on Palm Sunday when he, he comes in on the back of a donkey and they're singing his praises and they lead him through the streets. And then he gathers with his men for the Passover meal. And then right out of the Passover meal, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray and it was there that he was betrayed. <clears throat> and then just a day later was crucified on a cross of Calvary. Now what's significant about all of this? Well, when you go back and you understand the instructions that God gave to Moses to the children of Israel in the wilderness and to Aaron the first high priest, and you, if you want to research this, you go back to Leviticus chapter 16 and you begin to read God's instructions to Moses on how to treat this one day of the year, this holy day, a day known as Yom Kippur, it was the day of atonement, where people would be forgiven of their sins, and here, that word atonement, be brought back into oneness with God. At one with God is what the word atonement means. And so they, they had to go through this demonstration, this physical demonstration of what it meant that was really just a shadow of what was to come in the true fulfillment of atonement with Christ on the cross of Calvary. So stay with me, because all of this is so relevant to us today. So here is Jesus. He comes in, he's paraded through the streets. Now he's at the Passover meal. Now he's going out after that to be betrayed. At the same time, the chief high priest Lambs are brought from Bethlehem, just about seven miles away for inspection. They would bring maybe a flock of over 100 lambs that were raised to be perfect for this sacrifice on Yom Kippur in Jerusalem in the temple and be presented unto the Lord. That would be representative of the sacrifice needed to make atonement for the sins of the people that the priest was instructed to do. And he would inspect the lambs and he would find the one that was perfect. There was no spot or blemish on that lamb. Then they would take the lamb and keep the lamb in a small pen for about two weeks to make sure it wasn't sick. They wanted to make sure that lamb was perfect. And then once they knew the lamb was perfect, they would take the lamb, notice, and lead the lamb through the streets of Jerusalem, showing all the people we have selected our Passover lamb. That will make atonement for our sins before the Lord. Isn't it interesting that when John the Baptist first saw Jesus coming down by the sea and by the Jordan River, he saw him and he said, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John was in on something. Of course, you remember, John had a little bit of an inside touch with Jesus. You remember when Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and, and she had young baby Jesus within her womb and she went 
to Elizabeth's house who was now pregnant with what we know as John the Baptist, and that was a miracle. Mary's was a miracle. Elizabeth was too old to conceive, and yes, she had a miracle. And when Mary walked in the room, the baby John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb, and it so startled Elizabeth, she prophesied and declared the greatness of what was going on. So she didn't have to be convinced. She knew from within her inner being. So John had this connection before, you know, you know something? That Christ and John had this connection before either one of them were physically born from their mothers. They were connected in the womb. Wow. And so John sees him, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That wasn't the only time. Every time John saw him, he declared it because he knew that Christ had been that Lamb. Born in Bethlehem, brought to the city of Jerusalem, paraded through the streets in preparation for its death and sacrifice and its blood that would be shed. Because see, the chief high priest would, a part of his own ritual would be his own cleansing that he would do of himself and all the sacrifice he had to offer for his own sins and his cleansing, but then when he would go to offer that sacrifice for the people, he would take that blood of the perfect lamb and he would go into that inner sanctum of the, of the temple known as the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, where the tablets that God had written on with his own finger to give them the law that was given to Moses was kept in this Ark, this big box that was created to house those 10 commandments. There also was a jar of manna in there that represented God's provision in the wilderness. Also, there was Aaron's rod was in there. Aaron had this staff, you remember the story, they were trying to determine who's going to be the chief leader, spiritual leader of our people, and there was a lot of debate about that. And Moses said, well, bring all your staffs into my tent. They brought all the staffs into the tent and put them into their, what they call the tabernacle, which was like a, a special temporary temple that they could move around through the wilderness as they traveled their 40 years. And they put all those rods there. Now these are dead sticks, okay? Walking sticks. But they came back the next morning, there was one stick that had fresh buds on it. It was given life and it was Aaron's. It's like God says, I'm gonna bring spiritual life out of dead things and I'm, this is my leadership. And so there was witness of that in there. But it, what made it sacred was this. This box known as the Ark of the Covenant had cherubim on top of it, very decorative. And there between the cherubim was the Shekinah glory of God, a hovering spirit of God that was there over this holy place. And it made it so holy that no one could enter except one time a year. And the only way the priest could enter is after he'd gone through all of his cleansing rituals, then he would take the blood of that lamb and he would have to sprinkle that on the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple seven times and then come in to the altar that was supporting the, the ark and he would also use the blood. The blood had to precede the whole process of forgiveness. It doesn't make much sense to us, does it? It's just, it just seems odd to us in our culture today what all of this means. But when you back up and you see the big picture of what God was trying to do and let the people understand and get a glimpse of what was involved in a sacrificial love that was about to be poured out upon all mankind from heaven itself to us, it's only in that context can we begin to understand it. I love this verse of scripture that uh, the Lord says to us in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew that once and for all, there had to be atonement for sins that man could not do on his own. And that was the gift of God and of Jesus Christ. And that's why his blood came. There's a very long passage of scripture about this found in the book of Hebrews, and I wanna read a part of it to you because the writer in Hebrews is writing to the Jewish people 
and he knows that they have an understanding of the process of atonement that would take place through the ritual of the chief high priest given to them by Moses, the lawgiver, and they had followed that tradition from the wilderness for, for hundreds of years on up to the modern day of when Jesus was there here in the first century. But let me read this passage to you, and then I wanna briefly explain it, then we're gonna move on about the blood, okay? Here we go. In Hebrews chapter nine, beginning in verse 11, but when Christ came as the high priest of good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, it is not a part of this creation. Okay. The tabernacle was made by man to house the sacred things of God and to be a center and focus of worship. Man created that. But this was created by our creator because he is the creator. The creator stepped out of eternity and stepped into humanity and now is among us. And that's what they're trying to say. And look, let's go on. He did not enter this into the temple, into the holy of holies. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats or calves, but he entered the most holy place, that inner sanctum where the ark was kept. Oh, I love this. Once for all, by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Once Christ sacrificed his life on the cross of Calvary, there was never a need from that point forward for man to go through a ritual or a form of trying to obtain salvation. From that point forward, it had nothing to do about our works. It had only to do about the work that God had done through his son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrificial gift, giving us life and eternal salvation. And at that, you should say, amen. By the way, I wanna tell you, here at Gardens, the amens have been very weak today. <laughs> so if you drive by and you see people running laps around church, you're gonna go, what is going on? Well, they just weren't amening very well. I just thought we need to get their game up the next level, you know, come on. Amen. In the old time church, they'd be amening this. We can talk about the blood, buddy. I'll tell you, they got fired up. Let me read that again. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats or calves, that's what the high priest had to do, but he entered the most holy place, the inner sanctum, once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption, eternal salvation. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? And the church said, amen. amen. There we go. Wow. That's a lot, isn't it? That's old school. But see, when you understand the context of what Christ did for us and the gift that was prepared from God because the perfect lamb came from heaven to bring salvation to us. Now I want you to recognize something. Now when Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, he not only conquered sin, but he broke the back of the enemy of our souls. When we are covered by the blood of Christ, we are forgiven of our sins, we are reconciled to God, and we are protected against our enemies. We have a real enemy. And he's, he, he was defeated on that cross. Sin was defeated on the cross and death was defeated when Christ was put in the grave and resurrected on the third day. Amen? Amen. So we have, when we're under the blood of Christ, that simply represents the fact that we've acknowledged Christ as our Savior. He is our Lamb of God that took away the sins of our uh, lives. 
He's the one that through his shed blood, we are forgiven. He is our high priest. He's the one that went into the Holy of Holies for us. He became our Aaron. The people waited for that day because they knew on that day their sins were forgiven and they were brought into oneness with God. Praise God, when we look back to the cross and we review the blood of Jesus Christ, we recognize that we have been forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. Praise God. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me white as snow? What can make me white as snow? In other words, our hearts have this blackness on them called sin. But when the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives, that sin is washed away and our hearts become white as snow. Praise God. And listen, that simply represents in biblical terms, purity. We who were impure because of sin have been brought into purity before God. When you step into judgment day, and they call your name, here's what's interesting. They will take a white stone and place it in your hand. Oh, really? How did I deserve this? Because you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You acknowledged him as the savior of the world. You've allowed his blood spiritually to be applied to your heart and to your life, and your sins have been washed away, and you now walk in the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And you have been forgiven, you've been reconciled, and You are protected from your enemy. I love this passage of scripture. I've used it many times, found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It says, they, talking about those who overcame, they overcame him, him being the enemy of our souls, Satan. They overcame him, how? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Almost every night as I pray, I will quote this verse. Almost every night. Because when there comes a time in the Lord's prayer where it says, Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I am delivered from evil because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I remind my enemy often about the blood and I'm covered by the blood. You can't mess with me because I'm covered by the blood. I'm covered by the blood. You can't mess with my family. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. You, you hear sometimes, I've heard people say this, you know, when you're praying and when you're in a, a place of challenge and, and, and you're really battling, just listen, just plead the blood of Jesus. Well, what they're saying is, recognize Jesus, Lord, we have victory through Christ, so we're not gonna be intimidated. We're not gonna back up. We're gonna move forward with confidence because we know that if God be for us, who can be against us? I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ, amen? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. Sing it now. There is power, power, or wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. That's why we sing all those songs. We're just reminding ourselves of how blessed we are to be under the blood of Jesus, have our lives have been saved, we've been brought at oneness with God, and we've been given victory in this life through the shed blood of Christ on Calvary. Praise God. I've seen people, you know, you've seen portrayals of when they're gonna do an exorcist or something and you've seen the priest hold the cross up against the enemy. It's not the cross that has the power. It's the blood that was shed on that cross that has the power. But that cross represents what took place on the cross in Calvary. And when you are encountered with that divine love and that revelation, you've heard me say this many times, this story, but I do not believe there would be a Christ fellowship today if it hadn't been for what happened in 1983 
That December day, December 11th of 1983, when Donna and I and Todd and our daughter Noel had made our way to the Holy Land for our first trip ever. If you've never been to the Holy Land, you, you wanna go if you can. I know we got a trip coming up next year, and if, if in any way possible you can make that, that'd be just wonderful. It's, it's a life-changing experience. The Word of God just so comes alive. And we'd spent our week there or so, and the final day we went the way of the cross. I'm in the church at the Holy Sepulchre. We went up with Donna and the kids, and that's where they believe that the uh, Christ was crucified, and they built this humongous church over this granite little small hill that we call Calvary. And I saw pilgrims from all over the world coming to try to touch the stone where they believed the cross was placed. And we sat down there on a little bench and I'm watching that and I just felt I should linger and pray and, and I asked Donna to take the kids and go back to the hotel. We were leaving the next morning to come back to the US. And those few minutes I was there, I had this revelation come, it's like God parted so I could see a little bit deeper the depth of his love through the sacrifice of Christ. And from that moment of revelation, it prompted in me a more complete surrender of my life to him. And I said, Lord, whatever you want of me, you have me. He always had me on Sundays. I pretty well controlled Monday through Saturday, but he had me on Sundays. Now he had me every day of the week and whatever he wanted for me because I saw his love through the shed blood of my Savior on that cross of Calvary and it so broke me. That's why when Jesus says in John 14, 6, it's, it's, it's not being arrogant, it's, it's not being exclusive when he says, I am the way the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that's very simple to understand. Who else went through ahead of us to the Holy of Holies? Who else shed their blood on Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins? Who else has opened the door and cut the veil from the top to the bottom so all men could have access into the presence of God? Only Jesus, through his love, his grace, has done that. That's why he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And that's why his blood is so sacred and important to us. Have you ever really embraced him as your personal savior? John writes in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Because when you ask Christ into your heart, at that moment, the blood of Christ spiritually is applied to your spiritual heart and life. And the darkness of that sin is washed away. And we are now made pure so that we can enter into the presence of God. That's what the whole ritual was of cleansing, so there could be purity in the presence of God. God created us to be in relationship with him in the purity of that relationship, and that's what he's longing for. So I want us to pray today. In just a moment, we're going to also, at all of our campuses, receive Holy Communion. We're going to come and prepare for that. And as we do prepare, I want us to recognize that this is not just a ritual of the church, it is a sacred acknowledgement of God's love for us and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross by his shed blood and his broken body that are represented in the cup and the bread. I want you to know this, we love you so much. Our mission at Christ Fellowship is to help you encounter Jesus to know him in the level of intimacy that he wants you to know him, to grow in your relationship with him that will help you to grow in your relationship with your family and others. And in knowing him, you will discover your purpose. You will discover your purpose. They didn't have these in old school. 
They had the microphones that come up from right here. That's why they had to stand here. You'll discover that purpose, and then you'll go and impact your world with his love and message of life. That's what it's all about. I want you to bow your heads with me on all of our campuses, and let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can celebrate today your love and your sacrifice for us through your son Jesus on the cross. Once and for all, the penalty of sin was paid for. Atonement was made for all men and women. And now, Father, we can come and receive that atonement. We can be brought into oneness with you. We can experience the salvation that Pastor Todd taught us last week about. We can be born anew again in you. The Word of God says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord, you will be saved. So pray a little prayer with me right now. If you desire to receive Christ as your personal Savior, pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you as my Savior. You died on the cross for my sins. Your blood was shed so that I could be made pure. Forgive me, I pray, of all my past and my sins. And from this day forward, I commit to live for you and to serve you with all my heart. And I seal this commitment in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, I love you. And remember, there's power in the blood of Jesus. God bless. Thanks for joining us for this week's service. We pray that God has used this time to really impact your life. Yeah, but it doesn't have to end here. There are actually two ways that you can take this time into the rest of the week. First, you can share. Share in the comments what God spoke to you during this message, and then press the share button and send this to a friend who could use some encouragement. Second, get connected. Whether it's by pressing the subscribe button so that you get notified when new messages go live or by joining our Facebook group through the link in the description. Our team wants to learn how we can equip you with the right resources and encouragement to live the full life that God has in store for you. Yeah, and finally, you can also be a part of everything we're doing together to share the hope and the message of Jesus Christ by clicking the Give Now link in the description below. So your financial partnership is gonna allow us to reach even more people around the world for Jesus and help them to step into the full life that they were created for. Absolutely. Thank you again for watching. God bless.